Hey everyone, Emeron here. So this week on How to GM, I wanted to talk to you all uh, about skills in Cyberpunk. And namely, I want to talk about the skills for which there's no implicit mechanic. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that in the game, at least as of right now, the uh, end of July, start of August, as I'm recording this, it's the end of July, uh, but you'll be seeing this uh, while I'm away at Gen Con. Um, so for those skills that have like no implicit mechanical interaction in the game, either because of uh, the way that uh, say like a weapon works, so you're rolling to resist the effects of like a weapon or a particular type of ammunition such as poison, um, or there's no inherent mechanic like, uh, for example, drowning or asphyxiation that would call for a roll. Um, so you'll notice a lot of the skills that we're probably going to talk about today are aligned into the uh, education skill category um, because there are a fair number of those that are not very intuitive i will say as to like when would they apply so we're going to go through those skills that i judge uh, are underutilized or or uh, a little more uh, not intuitive to use and we're going to talk about uses for them because I do think that all skills exist in this game for a reason. It's just that most of the time they are not useful in what we would consider a typical edge runners game, which I think most of us as GMs, at least initially, are presented with the material to run. So when we're talking about those, you know, we're talking about a thing that starts in Night City. We're talking about the gig itself being questionably legal most of the time. Sometimes it's legal, but it's like you're helping a corporation or whatever. Um, but you're always looking at that as like a questionably, uh, you know, legal thing. Um, we're also looking at it as our edge runners are edge runners. They're not professionals that really fill any other niche outside of maybe performance in the case of rocker boys. Um, techs might or med techs even might have some fringe where this is true and execs definitely would. But we're going to talk about execs in another video because they are already a contentious inclusion uh, in edge runner campaigns. And I want to talk about them, giving them the time that they deserve. Thank you to all my patrons for the month of August. Your support makes doing what I do easier and allows me to do more with the time that I have. Thank you all so much. If you would like to support me in what I do, please join these fine people by following the link in the description below. Now back to the video. Thank you all. So let's talk about skills that uh, we have in that education category that I would deem as undervalued. Um, so these skills typically are going to be accounting, animal handling, sometimes bureaucracy. Um, that one has a few more uses and we'll talk about that business uh, composition is one that I see undervalued a lot of the time. Criminology is a big one. Uh, cryptography is another big one, and we're going to have a special highlight on that in an upcoming video. Uh, education itself is generally pretty undervalued. Gamble has some uses. We'll, we'll talk about that one, though, again, in more detail here in a moment. Uh, language can be uh, pretty underutilized, I think, despite the fact that it does feature pretty prominently on most character sheets. Our life path give us one of those language skills for free. Uh, and then beyond that, we have the science skills, which can be broken down into different scientific disciplines, those being things like biology, chemistry, physics, etc. Uh, and then finally, we have tactics and wilderness survival. So we've got the lion's share of the education category, I feel like isn't really well used. Um, and I know a lot of people are going to look and say, well, like, wow, intelligence is 
not a very useful stat for the vast majority of the skills that it entails. Um, and I'm here to say that that's not necessarily true. So intelligence governs, let's talk about the helpful skills that we're not going to talk too much about on this, um, that it does encompass, right? Just to kind of give background to that claim. So you've got library search and uh, perception, I believe, is governed by that. Let me double check. Yes, perception is also governed by intelligence. So it's, although it's not an education skill. So um, we've got uh, local expert is incredibly useful and we've got uh, your skill in library search and deduction. Those three already kind of justify taking intelligence as a at least decent stat and not totally dumping it um, because you will come across situations where you need to piece the, the picture together and you might need the aid of a skill role to do that. I've always been one at my table for allowing my players like piece two and two together and not insult their intelligence in that regard. Um, but if they need assistance piecing things together or they're piecing things together using contextual knowledge that maybe they as people don't have, then that's where that skill role starts to largely come into play. So let's talk about those skills now that I mentioned that are underutilized. So we're going to start from the top of the education skill section. We're going to read down. So first, uh, accounting. So this is described as the skill of balancing books, creating false books and identifying them, juggling numbers, creating budgets and handling day to day business operations. So obviously this is not something that a, an edge runner is probably going to have much experience with and probably won't use that often. But let's give an example of this, right? Say you are flavoring an edge runner who has a business background, and this is gonna to apply to the next couple skills that we have to talk about here as well. So in accounting, um, you know, a lot of that is gonna be falsifying records. So I know some of you are gonna say, well, what about forgery? So forgery is more about like, can I create a fake document? Accounting is how can I make the substance of a legitimate document that would contain illegitimate information look legit, right? So accounting is a little more in the nitty gritty and it is more involved as, as my account wife would say, it is uh, much deeper than I think a lot of people realize. And as someone who stayed up till 6 AM today from yesterday doing their own books, I can, I can tell you it's uh, it's a lot. So learning how to forge that is obviously a very involved task for an edge runner, right? Um, but if you are going on a anti-corporate kind of deal, right? This skill starts to get a lot more importance, right? If your exec wants to break into a rival corporation, cook their books and like make them look bad, this is how they will do it or how they would analyze the competition doing that. So this is always, there's a two way street when it comes to any skill where it's not just about what can you do? It's also about what can you identify, right? If you are a person trying to identify something has been done wrong or identifying like, for example, with bribery, there's a, there's a great example of a skill that I feel like my players at least haven't utilized enough. Bribery tells you how bribable someone is too. It's not just about like, do I bribe them successfully? It's about how would I successfully bribe them and having a sense for that. So from here, um, with accounting, we can use that as like cooking someone's books or analyzing crooked books. So it's a lot of the more downtime. I'll call it more of an open world skill. So like if you are uh, table is generally running along like a very linear path. Uh, and I don't mean that as like an insult, but I mean more as like a, if you are giving them, you know, hook after hook after hook after hook, and they're leading down one rabbit hole and they are not getting a ton of free agency in determining like where they're going next, um, outside of maybe the circumstances around where they're going next, this skill might have uh, a little less bearing than it would in an open world. 
So if you're playing an open world campaign where it is more player driven and player inspired, um, where you, the GM, maybe uh, are just designing prep around like what's happening in the city each day and like what might my players be able to pursue and you're just creating a bunch of threads and scattering those and saying, players, this is what the opening scream sheets for the day say, this starts getting more valuable. And the reason I say that is because now, if there is a corporation hiring for an accountant and your players have some reason to dislike that corporation, this skill starts getting to be more like you could do some really interesting stuff with, with their books, making them look bad, etc. cetera. Um, so it's enough about that. I'm gonna skip animal handling for now because I wanna talk about these other kind of business related skills. Uh, so next we got bureaucracy, which is a skill for dealing with bureaucrats, cutting red tape, knowing who to talk to in a bureaucracy, how to reach them, and how to extract information from bureaucracy. So it's about knowing what paper to file, which people you're filing it to, who to get in touch with to actually get shit done. So if you are uh, politically motivated, or if you're trying to pull out someone who is uh, a politician or someone who's politically involved, this could come in handy just from a standpoint of like knowing how to navigate the maze of names that most organizations are gonna have around their most senior people, right? This is going to let you pierce some of that veiling of that information that a typical corporation is gonna want to do and it's gonna let you pull it out. So again, this is not gonna be like inherently useful to every role, but say you're in media, medias are gonna benefit a ton from this. Rocker boys could benefit a decent amount from this. Um, fixers could benefit a decent amount from this. Execs, again, are gonna benefit a decent amount from this because all of those roles are social interaction roles. Their power is not in wielding iron, it is in wielding words and really manipulating to the core of whatever their end goal is, right? For a rocker boy, it's gonna be fame. For a media, it's gonna be breaking that big story open that sinks a corporation or achieves some other social end. Uh, and for a fixer, it's gonna be getting goods and getting them as cheaply as possible, right? Or getting information and getting that as cheaply as possible. Um, so bureaucracy is gonna help you kind of navigate that and, and weave in some of those narratives uh, that allow you to kind of talk your way out through a power structure, right? Um, so next we have business. So this is gonna be a little more of a catch-all for some of the broader aspects of these last couple skills. Um, so business in the book is described as skill regarding the knowledge of basic business practices, laws of supply and demand, employee management, procurement, sales, and marketing. So this is an interesting one because there are calls for this in some pre-written gigs when you're dealing with business people. And uh, you might not think on its surface you would deal with corporate types very often as an edge runner, but there are times when the corporates come out into your world. And sometimes knowing how to speak their language and negotiate them down is just as effective as killing them right? Because you're able to get them to back off by making them realize what a terrible business move they've made. So a practical example of this in the real world uh, is right now how so many people are criticizing uh, Twitter for taking on X because of all of the business caveats that changing a name like that comes with, right? Or that uh, Ubisoft is experiencing with their the backlash around them deleting player accounts. Right? And I get that that's gonna date this video a little bit, um, but those of you who are watching this much later, you're probably still going to at least have some recollection of these things, especially the X Twitter thing. Um, because again, we, we, at this point where I'm recording this, don't know what that outcome is gonna be, but everyone who is commenting on it right now is talking about like, well, what about your search engine optimization? What do people call the stuff that's on your platform that has all been like, interbranded because tweets and Twitter, they rely on each other, right? You tweets, retweets, quote tweets, Twitter messages, Twitter video, like, and those last two are a little less, you know, whatever. 
But I ask you, when the platform changes to X, what are you gonna call those? And I'll let you answer that for yourselves at home. So bottom line is that if you're dealing with a CEO who's about to do something real fucking ah uh ah -uh cringe like that, business checks are going to be your party being able to negotiate and say, well, hold up there. What if I told you this is a really, really dumb move and it's more impactful than just your brand is getting a facelift, right? What if I told you that some business types are gonna really, really try to fuck you over in Night City and this allows you to basically tell them, hey, uh, don't do that because people are gonna suffer and that's not good for your business and get them to hear it from the perspective that they would hear it from. So that's what business you'll largely see kind of factor in. It's one of those semi-persuasion skills. And it's just taking that persuasion from a very, dare I say, capitalist point of view, right? From a very like productivity, buzzwordy kind of take, right? Whereas with persuasion, you're usually uh, arguing logics or ethics business, you're arguing profitability. You're arguing what this is going to counter cost. What is the opportunity cost of making this choice that could be very, very, very damaging uh, to your brand and its identity, right? Um, so that's business and it could be more useful than you give it credit for. Again, the social classes of the game are going to take this and make something very good out of it, especially people like fixers, medias, and execs. Those three collectively uh, are probably going to get more out of this, even than like a rocker boy. Rocker boy, maybe they, they do a little business when they're negotiating, maybe like a contract, if they're looking to get signed on for some act or uh, production or something. But overall, those other roles in that category are probably going to benefit more off of it. So now let's go back. Um, now that we've kind of talked through most of the business related ones, let's talk about animal handling. So uh, as the book makes pretty clear, animals are not very common in the time of the red. They are just not very common at all. Um, so this is going to come down more if you are playing like a nomad campaign, right? Nomads are going to more likely than not interact with animals. Um, and so this is one where if you've got like more of a road trip campaign, um, say like the cowboys of old, you're trying to rustle some cattle, right? Say you're, you know, you're not trying to, you know, protect the herd. You're trying to steal the herd right? And they do exist, you know, these bioengineered cows and cattle are, they, they're out there. Um, they're just usually not very close to the city. So in Night City, we're not really dealing with this, you know, unless some shipment of cattle has arrived in the city and now we're, you know, looking to steal it there. But most of the time it's going to be out on like a road trip campaign. Um, and it's going to allow you things like hunting. So an idea for how this could be useful in Night City, um, which kind of stems off the short I released recently about getting nibbles in 2077, is this can help you maybe maintain a pet, right? If you've got a pet in Night City, this is maybe going to help you care for that pet, right? And um, it's not something maybe you're gonna invest in at character creation. But the moment that you start seeing like, hey, we might need to deal with animals, we might need to deal with, um, you know, rustling cattle, we might need to do that. You might buy a skill chip for this. You might very well invest a couple of your IP into this. It just depends, you know, on like how much warning you have. Um, but there are systems by which, you know, you might interact with an animal, even in the city, and this could help you. Alternatively, you could also utilize this with some of the drone options that we've got in Interface Red Volume 1. Check it out, it's very, very good. Um, and it does collate some of the other DLC that I think are really, really good, but it's got a drone chapter, which is only accessible if you buy the book. And they do talk about like dog drones and stuff like that in there. So you could take this and kind of use that to essentially come up with rules 
for attack dogs and stuff for your players. So again, this is going to lean more into like, how do we homebrew this to make this work? But this could be something that like maybe a lawman especially wants to take up or a nomad wants to take up because they do have access to some of these things that your average person just doesn't, right? Lawmen might have a canine unit. And I know in Danger Gal dossier, which uh, I will be probably devouring as quick as possible when you're watching this, um, they do have a character that DICE has uh, featured already talking about they have a canine companion. And even if this is a cybered out canine, probably still using animal handling on it, I would bet. Um, so that is another good use for, for that skill that uh, you might want to consider adapting into your games. Um, next, we're going to talk about composition. So composition is, in my opinion, critically underutilized for roles like Rocker Boy and Media. And why do I say this? So when we're talking about writing or putting a work of art together, composition is the skill we're supposed to use for that. And I know some of you are going to look at this and say, well, there is a like a photo video skill deeper in. We'll, we'll talk about that one. But the distinction here, as I've heard it, and I agree with this, is it's one thing, like I am right now, taking a video and having the skills to take that video and operate the equipment and the audio and all of that. That is what that photo video check does, is it lets you, uh, you know, frame and capture the thing correctly, make sure everything's in focus. It makes you, uh, you know, dial in the audio levels correctly, all of that. Whereas composition is about when you edit that video, like I will be doing this one, when you edit down that video and you are looking to make sure your message that you're looking to release to the world comes over clearly well like what are we gonna you know how are we doing that you know how skilled are you at picking the right words using the right imagery um you know maybe picking the right b-roll for your video all of this is where composition comes in so it's about those fringe elements and how we incorporate them into our finished piece right um once we captured it and we processed it the composition is the kind of the processing side of that. Um, so after that, we've got criminology. So criminology is the skill of discovering clues by dusting for fingerprints, doing ballistic tests, examining evidence, searching through police records and files. So lawmen, <laughs> pretty much lawmen are going to probably benefit the most from this. Um, there could be cases where, you know, maybe you have a retired cop solo or nomad or uh, even an exec that works maybe in like a counterintelligence division that wants to do something with this. And that would be, you know, that that would be kind of where I would say this skill would maybe see some additional usefulness, right? You're going to see uh, it being used by these execs to like comb through those records to hunt the thing that they're after, right? Um, so it is something where ultimately um, that is going to kind of help with uh, those searches, the research behind it, all of that. Medias might also benefit off of this just from the police record database kind of searching um, because it isn't going to be organized or, um, you know, put together in any kind of way that looks like your average, you know, pop media article or, um, you know, garden patch site. None of those things are going to look quite the same as a police report. And the data is written in a way that is built for police records to be, you know, strung together and maintained. So a media could benefit from this as well. Um, so just, you know, parsing again, more parsing of information in a specific lens that, uh, you know, isn't going to be covered by something more as a catch-all. Um, so next up, I'm going to talk about cryptography. So cryptography is the skill of encrypting and decoding messages. So there are a couple uses for this. And again, most of this is probably going to be useful to social classes. 
So we're talking medias because you're probably going to want your, you know, sources that you're trying to protect, right? If you've got a source you're trying to protect for a story that you're trying to write and produce something for, you're gonna want it to be encrypted. You're not gonna want other people to know who you're talking to. You're not gonna want them to, you know, be able to pick that up and then kill the people that you're getting information from. Uh, if you're a lawman, this might also apply because again, you've got probably CIs, right? You've got confidential informants scattered around the city and you wanna encrypt that information. Fixers, data brokerage stuff. You don't want that information getting leaked to anyone else who could devalue it. The more scarce the information, the more valuable it is. And that is how you keep it scarce, is by making sure that only you and the intended recipient who's paid you for it get that information. No one gets to listen in for free. Um, even some other roles like exec might make use of this. Again, it's all about that encryption decryption side of things. And so this is where you get radio scramblers, descramblers. They make use of this skill. They will make use of the ability to do this because now when I'm producing a message, I can choose to encrypt that. Even Netrunners might take uh, up levels in the skill um, once they've covered their other bases simply for that same reason, because they also are data brokers. Usually fixers are getting their intel from one of two sources. They're getting it either from the horse's mouth or someone who's talked to them like a media, or they're getting them from a Netrunner who stole it, right? Those are like usually the two most reliable ways that they can get information. So when we look at this, that's gonna be more what it's used for. So it's gonna be useful if you wanna keep information out of the hands of someone else who shouldn't know it. And you as a GM can punish your players for not doing well on this by making other people aware of the information. And so now when your fixer goes back and says, hey, I've got that data you asked for, Mr. Exec, the agreed upon price, as I recall, was a thousand eddies. And they're like, yeah, except the competition heard we were looking. So now I can only pay you 500. Price got cut in half because now it's gonna be inherently less useful. And it's gonna be, you know, like now that that becomes, you know, a stumbling block, or maybe now like they try to use that information that was peered in on and lo and behold, someone was waiting for their agents and they lost people and they're gonna come looking for you looking to take an eye for an eye, right? So all good uses for it. Um, moving on, next we got deduction, which is the skill of taking several clues and leaping to non-obvious conclusion or medical diagnosis. So this is going to be, if you're playing a detective character or someone who has great problem solving competency, this is going to be the skill that makes you a Sherlock Holmes. Um, and it's going to have a little more like obvious implication when I kind of explain what you might call deduction in D and D, which is insight. It's the ability to like take seemingly unrelated information and tie it together and really like put together what you're looking at. And again, this is really a useful skill for players that want to know things, but maybe don't have enough of the meta knowledge of the world, like maybe someone like me would, where I just absorb the lore like a sponge. Um, Deduction's going to let you, the GM, share your lore bits with them when they pass a high enough roll. And it's going to make the less obvious things in the environment around them scream red flags to them and give them more contextual information to approach a threat or a challenge from. Um, so that that's, a pretty useful skill and it I think goes without uh, saying. Um, next we have education, which is the skill of general knowledge equivalent to a basic school education, allowing you to know how to read, write, use basic math and know enough history to get by. So this is all of those checks essentially, right? If you're dealing in a lot of numbers, this is something where you the GM can actually withhold numbers from your party. You could just say, yeah, like you recognize that, you know, each crate in the room has a, you know, quantity five printed on it for, let's say, like bags of kibble or something. And so now, like, they'll know, yeah, each box has five. How many boxes are in the room? Roll an education check. Let's see if you know how to, like, deduce that, right? Or roll deduction. There's another case where deduction could also serve. Um, or, you know, if, if you're walking in and you are 
dealing with someone who maybe is questionably literate, they might have a really low education score. You only need to have an education of two, right? Which is like just enough of an IQ to get you uh, by in the city. But if you know you don't have a high intelligence score and you don't have an education, this is gonna probably be one of your lower stats. And that can be cool for other reasons, right? Because now it's kind of like driveland vehicle where like if you have a certain base in the skill, you know, you can competently just hop in a car and start it up and drive down the street without really having a question. And the only time you're rolling the skill check is if you're doing a risky maneuver, right? Education can be the same thing. As long as you have a skill base of at least X, right? Like you don't need to make checks when you read something, when you're trying to write something, or when you're trying to, you know, collect enough information based on what you've seen to really make sense of the situation. And this is more one of those cases, again, where it's going to lean on the players having less meta knowledge that they're acting on. And it's gonna be one that you wanna use if your players are maybe less informed about the world or the situation they find themselves in and see if they know enough about where they are to deduce that, right? Um, and again, it's going to be some of the things that, you know, maybe they don't know as much about the fourth corporate war as their player does, right? So we roll education to see, do you know, you know, do you know, do you have any awareness of these things? Um, and so the next skill is gamble. So gamble's pretty straightforward. Um, mechanically, it doesn't have a lot of implicit uses. Uh, it is by and large pretty underutilized, I would say, in the rules. Um, there are some uses for it in DLC. Um, one of those being the ELO TCG, which I have not played yet, but if given the opportunity to do so at Gen Con with uh, a couple of my friends that'll be there, I uh, I will. I'm gonna pick, uh, I'm gonna take a couple of playing card decks with me and, you know, we're gonna experiment with that and, and have some fun with it. Um, but yeah, ELO TCG is one of the few stated skill uh, checks for utilizing that ability in the game, right? And so when we talk about gambling in a more widespread context or in a more like broad usage case, we might talk about, say you walk into a bar and they've got billiards tables, right? And you, a, you know, a gambler are trying to figure out what is a good bet or a bad bet, or even better, if someone is trying to hustle you, if you win and you, they're like, oh man, fuck, I want a chance to win my money back, double or nothing. And then they just sink you because they are better, you know? So gambling checks can be used again to identify, is it a smart bet? Not just, did I bet well, it's, was it a smart bet? Does this ring of anything that might be sketchy? In ELO TCG, it is, uh, I believe, a contested check for gamble to cheat, right? So this is telling you, is your opponent cheating? You know, um, so figuring odds, playing games of chance successfully is what it governs. And a lot of what I just mentioned is exactly that. It is finding a safe bet or finding a smart bet and finding out whether you're getting utterly hosed by that guy across the table who is doing something and you're not sure if it's good or bad unless you have a high skill base in Gamble. So next up, we're talking language. So in language, we're talking, you know, this is one of those skills that break down into subcategories. So when you pick a language, you're choosing a specific language when you want to increase the skill and you get a level four of one language from your background. When you take the skill, you have to take at least two levels of streetwise as our streetwise, uh, street slang as a language when you are making a brand new character. So with this in mind, consider being not terribly proficient in a place like Little China or Old Japan Town or um, another spot in the city that has a large demographic of P 
people who speak another language like uh, Haywood. Haywood would have like a large Hispanic population, at least uh, based on the way 2077 represents it. Uh, I would need to read back through that area of the core rulebook for Red to see if it, it mimics that. Regardless though, anytime you're walking through an ethnic neighborhood of some kind where a language is more predominant than street slang, you are going to be rolling checks like this to see, do you comprehend where you're going? Do you know what's ahead of you? Do you know that that sign is danger ahead? You know, or that that language that you're reading is trying to warn you or, you know, threaten you even in the case of you're walking into gang territory like Tiger Claws, right? They might be spray painting something Japanese. Do you know enough Japanese to know that that is a threat? Or do you know enough, um, what's the other one? Um, like if you're going into voodoo boy territory, uh, even though the voodoo boys of red are very different than those of 2077, you might be walking into something where they are using broken, um, they're using broken Creole and you may or may not know that they're trying to threaten you, right? So this is good for those cases. And again, a lot of these skills are going to be something that leans a little heavier on us as GMs to present that challenge to our players. Like you're walking through unfamiliar territory, you're walking through a place where you don't know the streets, you don't know the language, you don't know all of these things that are now, maybe you have to rely on the one person in your crew that does know Japanese, or they do know, you know, enough of the local language to get by, right? So that's where we just make that more useful. You incorporate warnings or contextual information the players just miss if they don't know the language or can't roll high enough to comprehend it. And this is where, you know, like translation chips and stuff uh, from 2020 would come in big handy here. But for those, we're looking at just general skill chips in the language and they start to translate for you. Um, next, we've got, I want to include a brief mention of local expert. I do think that this has enough contextual uses to find a way to be useful um, because it's going to be a little more about the case of living somewhere and knowing what is a good spot of town. You know, if I walk two blocks in direction A versus two blocks in direction B, do I know which of those is going to get me shot and which of those is going to be safe at nighttime? Do I know, you know, local expert. Local expert's gonna tell me, do I know? And everyone gets two points in the district labeled their home. So usually the way I take that is, you know the ins and outs of your part of the city fairly well, if you have a high local home skill base, right? So beyond your local area though, how well do you know the rest of the city? And again, we go back to some of these social classes, right? Things like Fixer, things like Media, uh, even Rocker Boy would really benefit. Execs, eh, maybe, you know, like that might be useful, but you could also probably just, that's why you hired the edge runner. They know this part of the city better than me. So you could maybe justify, you know, having it if you really want someone, maybe they grew up in Haywood, for example, and you want to uh, showcase that by giving them a higher uh, Haywood local expert than, uh, you know, they might otherwise have. Maybe now they live in the Glen, but they know Haywood really well, you know? So this is a way to flavor your character in and a way to like make that feel really good, right? And make it feel like you're doing something. So the next thing down we have is science. So science is really, really fun because it's another one like local expert in language that you need to take skill in a branch of science. So these are uh, geology, mathematics, physics, zoology, anthropology, biology, chemistry, and history. So it accounts for some of these things that we may not think of as particularly scientific. Uh, and it incorporates that kind of like more theoretical knowledge of how something did work, right? 
And the way you can make this work out is say you're walking through a lab, right? How do you destroy this lab or dismantle it safely? What's your edge runner now? Roll a science, biology, or chemistry, whatever, you know, if it's a drug lab, you're probably looking at chemistry, right? You're trying to Walter White that shit. The other fun, like, homebrew rule that we could look at for this would be, um, obviously, technique is one thing, right? Where, like, they say you brew things like street drugs using a basic tech roll. So it is not use your typical um, your typical science like you might expect it would because the science is the theory. The doing is the tech. But this is how I would homebrew it to make this be more important for that drug runner tech that you want to have. If you want to safely or more purely maybe reducing the addiction of a drug like has been showcased in Black Chrome Plus with Piranha Smash, say you want to refine a substance and make it an easier addiction check on the person who would consume it. Well, we could use some science to do that. Science chemistry can maybe help with that. If we're looking at, you know, trying to ascertain something about Biotechnica, you as a media may want to take certain science in biology because you're trying to decipher, you know, like what is the practical impacts of this gene therapy they're testing? Well, you might not be able to really make sense of that information unless you roll high enough on a biology science check. Uh, physics could help you potentially design better bullets or better aerodynamics or things like that. So there are all of these things that maybe like conceptually could act as a complementary skill check and give a bonus to another skill. Science is one of these that has such great usability in that sphere compared to other skills. So that would be what I would use science for and make it uh, more appropriate. Next, we have tactics. So tactics is the skill of managing a large scale battle effectively and efficiently. A character with this skill usually knows what must be done to direct a battle and on how enemy forces may react. Tactics for me has always been if you are the attacking force or a defending force. I mean, you, you could argue this for a defending force as well. Um, I usually as a GM don't lean on my NPCs using their tactics this much. Although I would love to see if there is a more concrete use of this skill um, at Gen Con, uh, maybe even by the time you're watching this, I'll have gone to uh, some QA panels. This may be one I want to ask uh, RTG about and get their feedback on like, what would you use tactics for in an NPC? How would you incorporate that and make that meaningful, right? Um, because in my opinion, this is more of a player skill. Right? This is a player facing skill more than it is an NPC one. And the reason I say that is when players are planning a heist, they're going to need to think about where are my entries, where are my exits, where are the cameras, where are the guards. And tactics is going to maybe help them better identify in a meta contextual sense where to enter and exit or what to plan for as they're getting materials for the gig, right? It's going to uh, maybe illuminate the best suite to get in that hotel to be near the security and to be able to disable that quickly as is seen in like 2077 that's a tactics role the prep stuff so this is again maybe a fixer thing is they're going to take fixers uh where they uh are good at this or solos who have a military background they might be good at this or um maybe net runners even when they are looking at assessing you know where is the best place for me to breach their network and like shut stuff down they're going to have a more transparent idea of like the best way to go about infiltrating and navigating that intrusion through a network um so this is all going to be again something where you as a gm can supply your players with a little more meta contextual knowledge than they would otherwise have uh, and this could also help supplement uh perception checks because again like 
if you've done your tactics ahead of time, you might have the ability to better situationally be aware when you're in the context of this because you briefed on what you're doing ahead of time. So again, I think that that's a great way to make more use of this skill and like, again, flavor a character that knows what they're doing in and out. And now, last but not least in this education skills category, we come to wilderness survival. So wilderness survival is a skill for knowing how to survive comfortably in the wilderness. This knowledge includes how to set traps, forage for wood, track game, build shelters, and make fires. Road trip skill, big road trip skill. Are you caught in the wilderness of the Badlands? Do you not have much to your name at all in terms of creature comforts or secured food or any of these things? Maybe your vehicle got wrecked miles from the city, right? Like maybe you're, you've driven a day or more outside the city before you got attacked by go gangers and now your vehicle is disabled and you don't know if or when help is coming for you and you don't maybe have the tools or the material to fix your car. What do you do? Well, you got to tough it until you get back to the city. And a day's travel can be hundreds of miles if we're talking the difference between, you know, car traveling a day and a person traveling by day on foot. The, the fastest guy I know personally is my brother. He hiked the Arizona Trail back in uh, the beginnings of, or the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020. And that is, for those of you who are unaware, over 800 miles of trail that goes between the northern border of our state with Utah and the southern border of our state with Mexico. And that whole trek, uh, you know, is it takes weeks to do that, obviously, right? And the, the most he did during that whole time he was doing that in a single day his best days, he just got over 30 miles. And that is someone with physical training who was able to like prepare for this. And it wasn't near the beginning or the end of his trek he was doing that. It was like in the middle where he was like in his element. He'd been going for a couple days already. And he was, you know, doing that kind of a pace after really, really getting used to it. And when we're talking about being, you know, like, 200 miles maybe from the nearest city. You don't have an agent that can connect to the city net unless you have the utilities necessary to do that. Like if you're carrying around like a uh, net balloon because you do have like a world sat balloon that if you're deploying up 50 miles from a city, you can get internet connection. Like that's in black chrome for those of you who don't have it. It's another reason to buy it. It's got some great survival gear in it. But wilderness survival is gonna be all about taking the very fundamental things that you need to survive and providing for them when they would otherwise not be there or not be obvious, right? What route is edible, you know, or which one's gonna kill you because it's poisonous? Um, you know, like those are the kinds of things that you are gonna want the skill for. Um, another use for it within the confines of a typical edge runner game is gonna be if you are caught outside, as in like out in the city, unable to find shelter for a night and you are looking to maybe jury rig a sh uh, shelter or a uh, safe place to kind of rest for the evening, this may let you craft a shelter. This is going to be the thing that lets you make a camp. Uh, and I would argue that that could apply even in the city, even if you're not scavenging for things like the skill describes, um, it does let you um, you know, set certain traps or things too. So all of this could come in handy even in the middle of the city. So checks for this might, uh, you know, really help in situations like nomads, especially probably will benefit the most from this. But I would argue that um, even other roles such as techs could benefit from this because it is dealing with things like traps that they might have a vested interest in doing well. Um, so now that we're out of the education skills, let's go through some of the other stuff in the book that I think uh, could see some further love in terms of uh, the ability to kind of use them and, and make them more 
uh, effective, right? Or at least give them usability where it may not be obvious how you might utilize them. Um, so one of the things that I don't see used all that often is acting. So acting is deception in a nutshell, right? It's visual deception. If you're trying to behave unlike you normally would, uh, or trying to put together a disguise, acting is what you're going to roll for it, right? And it's going to be something where you um, typically are gonna pair this maybe with like wardrobe and style, but it's not gonna be something where your wardrobe's gonna matter worth shit if you can't behave the right way. Um, great example of this. You're trying to break into a convention, a corporate convention. You're normally a street punk. B business types are going to behave a very, very different kind of way than a street punk is going to behave. So does your street punk know how to behave correctly in the, uh, you know, in the presence of these corporate types? Role acting, do, do they know, right? And this could be a way to like add, um, you know, beyond just persuasion and things. This could be a way to add some of that tension and really make it like if you're trying to be a sutter, like subterfuge type player or really stealthy and deceptive, acting is probably something you're going to want to get your hands on, right? It's going to be a skill you're going to want to invest a little into because there will be cases where you're going into unfamiliar territory and the wardrobe you wear is not going to be enough to pass. You need to walk the walk correctly. And this can also be used uh, either this or perception, I would argue, to identify someone else who's pretending, right? Um, most skills in this game, in case it's not clear at this point, could be rolled as contested checks to each other, right? You're rolling persuasion on your opponent. Your opponent's going to roll persuasion right back to see if they succeed at being persuaded or not. Because if they can see through your persuasive effort, they're going to like counter you and just say, no, that's not how this is going to work. Um, so the next, uh, thing I want to talk about is, uh, personal grooming. So personal grooming and wardrobe and style are things that your fashion really benefits from. And again, this is going to be another thing. Like, can you pass off looking the part, right? Or do you need to lean harder into your acting? Personal grooming is going to be, did you brush your hair correctly or style it correctly to look the right way? Have you cleaned recently? You know, are you are you able to like really cleanse yourself of the normal filth that you live in because you're living in a not so great part or poor part of the city, right? Like, did you really get all that out of there before you went into this negotiation or this environment that is maybe less hospitable to edge runners? Um, this is going to kind of affect that. And there are things uh, in your fashion wear that can help you do better at this too. Um, so I definitely encourage GMs to try using that and wardrobe and style a little more when we're entering a social situation. And then based on having the right look and the right style when you're entering a place, you might get easier times on your checks or maybe get harder times on your checks. You could even set like a threshold, like above a DV, whatever is a success above DV here is a critical success. And if you fail it, then you get a negative, right? If you are just standard passing, they're not going to think anything is special of you. They're not going to look down on you. If you exceed the upper threshold, well, they're going to think a lot of you. They're going to maybe be willing to accept that you are a big deal, right? And then that's going to make um, the social environment you're in more accepting of you. Um, and if you fail it, then they're going to be less accepting of you and therefore make your negotiation more difficult. So for social campaigns, this one's really good. Um, and I would argue that again, your social classes like Rockerboard are gonna get a lot of benefit out of that. Um, so beyond that, the only other skill that I maybe really wanted to draw attention to is paint, draw, or sculpt. Um, are you an artist who is trying to depict something and get that message across? So again, this is going to be like the practical side of you're not using electronic uh, means maybe to draw your art out. Or even if you are, this is going to 
be how skilled you are in doing that. I'm a terrible physical artist, but give me digital art and I can go ham. I can do plenty in the digital sphere uh, that I can't do in the physical sphere. I'm not good at, you know, drawing stuff. My wife is much better at that than I am. Um, and I know a bunch of my friends that are, are better at physically drawing stuff than I am. But I still get turned to for digital art because digital art is what I know. It's what I'm good at. So I get the rough thing they've done afterward and start adding that into like a digital space and start messing with that more. So that's going to be more about, uh, you know, producing those physical medium artworks and like doing something that makes maybe makes value. You could be a Banksy type, right? If you are a rocker boy and your medium of influence maybe isn't, uh, it, it isn't something on the garden patch, or if it is, it's like photos of your drawings, in which case you might take some photography too, but your drawing is what you're going to be leaning against, right? So performance stuff, that's a big deal. Uh, execs might take this to, um, you know, be able to appraise artwork uh, and really understand it, right? And uh, be able to, you know, recognize a Picasso when it's a Picasso, right? Uh, and you could use this in tandem with forgery to forge those artworks. Um, those of you who haven't seen it, uh, there's a uh, great movie, uh, Interstate, what is it? Interstate 66, I think is the name of the film. Um, and it's, it's a road trip film. Very niche, very uh, underground. My wife is the one who showed it to me. I love it. Uh, and they've got a whole scene that takes place in the uh, gallery of art forgery, right? It's the, the Museum of Art Forgery. So everything in the, this museum is a forged piece. And, uh, you know, the authentic ones are, uh, you know, maybe nowhere to be found. I'm not going to spoil the movie or anything, but it's a fun scene. And it leads to some ideas of like how you could use this skill and maybe make some money with it, which is really what we're looking to do in Cyberpunk. Um, so ultimately, I feel like that's a pretty comprehensive list of the skills that I don't find particularly uh, useful often, right? Niche skills that maybe don't seem to play into the game often. But when it does, you might be thankful you have those skills. So as always, if you think I've missed something, please let me know down in the comments. I would love to uh, explore any skills that you find uh, you know, important or interesting, or if you have uh, different ideas than I do for how to make some of these skills useful, I would also love to hear that. Um, I think that there's plenty of opportunity for these skills to be useful in homebrew and to really breathe new life into them. Like I said, gambling wasn't, really a stated useful skill until yellow tcg came out and now it's a mechanic in that game to be able to gamble correctly and you know make better bets or cheat your opponent when you're playing that so i'd love to hear those ideas as well to better implement these skills uh, whether in homebrew or in actual uh, rules as written contexts in the game i definitely always like hearing ideas around this because i feel like this is where uh, we, as GMs, get to present our players with ways to be creative that they may not have realized. Like these, some of these skills seem kind of throwaway, but they can be very cool if given the right context. Um, so yeah, that's going to do it for this week. Again, my name is Emeron. Please like and subscribe if you think I have earned it. As always, I hope you have a wonderful morning, evening, or afternoon wherever you are in the world. Stay healthy, stay safe, and until we talk again, peace.